Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to announce our next speaker. We have Roberta Estes back to talk to us uh, about autosomal DNA through the generations. Now, uh, Roberta has a bachelor's and master's degree in computer science, a master's in business administration, but from a genetic genealogy point of view, she's best known for being one of the premier genetic genealogists on the planet. And it's an absolute pleasure that she's flown all the way over from America to be with us here today. So you could give a please a warm welcome for Roberta. Can you all hear me all right? Nope. So, all right. Well, thank you. I'm sorry we're a couple minutes um, late starting today, but, um, you know, technical stuff happens. And uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, we're going to talk about um, DNA through the generations. And I want to tell you, uh, my granddaughter, who's a teenager, was supposed to be here co-presenting with me. Now, we had a little family issue happen, and she can't be here today. But the reason I wrote this presentation, it wasn't because I wanted to do a presentation, it was because I'm using this DNA to teach my grandchildren, as she's 13, and she understands it. So if my granddaughter can understand this, I know every single one of you in this audience can understand this, and she is going to use this to teach genetics in her high school. I want you to know that. Because so it's not hard. It's all just a matter of looking at it from the perspective of building one step at a time. So this, you know, just pretend I'm 13 and, you know, I got the purple dress and the big hair. And, uh, I'll try and talk to my granddaughter's voice, you know. So we are looking today at DNA through the, uh, the generations. I have a blog. This is my blog uh, address, dnaexplained.com, right up here. And I want to encourage all of you to subscribe and to use the blog. There's almost 900 articles having to do with DNA. Some are technical, some are just fun and lighthearted. Um, every Sunday I run something about my ancestors. And if you don't want to read about my ancestors, that's fine. But there's a piece of DNA, how I've used it for those ancestors in every article. So it's actually how I use DNA for each one of them. It's different. So I really encourage you to use it, subscribe. It's free. You know, you can't get better than free. So, so um, you remember Sister Sledge? We are family. I got all my sisters with me. You remember? Come on, guys. Wake up. Yes? If you don't admit to remembering, I'm going to sleep. Okay? Okay. That's best. Every, so here's what we do. We are family. Get up, everybody, and, well, it used to be a different word, but in our family, it's swab. Get up, everybody, and swab. We are family. Apologies to Sister Sledge. So, we all swap in our family, and we are going to talk about how our autosomal DNA compares to them, everybody in our family. And autosomal DNA is inherited from every one of your ancestors. Now, I hate to think of myself as an ancestor, but to my grandchildren, I'm an ancestor. I mean, I'm a grandma, but their parents are ancestors, too, because anybody who's not you is an ancestor because you got some of their DNA. So, if you aren't familiar with the basics of DNA and how it works, uh, Emily Ocelino, who's out the Family Tree DNA booth, has a couple of beginning books left to spell. She brought them over, and they're, they're great. I helped her proofread them when she wrote the book. So, that's a good resource for you to start. So, here's an inheritance mosaic. And you can see up here that this person in yellow, the, the, of the two parents that are yellow and purple, they got a yellow chromosome and a purple chromosome, and that represents half of each of their parents. But in every generation, that DNA gets mixed. So by the time you get two generations further down here, these chromosomes have lots of colors in them, and that represents their ancestors' DNA. The problem is, of course, that we, have, we don't know whose DNA is whose unless you have some basis for comparison to the past. So the child receives one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad and exactly half of each parent's DNA. But two children don't receive the same half. They usually receive part of the same half. So you have one child, uh, a dad that's blue and mom that's pink, and so this child could have blue here and pink here, and this could be reversed. So while they have the same, they don't have all of the same. So that's why we tell people, test your siblings, 
test your parents, siblings, actually test everybody you can convince to test. Um, it's okay if you give them a couple glasses of wine first because, if, if, you know, if you're doing a swab, it generally works. So I can say that, they might. Okay. <laughs> so here is what this, when you, you receive half of your DNA from each parent, but on the average, you only receive 25% of your DNA from each grandparent. Now, average is like one size fits all. How many of you went and got a free t-shirt out there someplace? And they give you something that says one size fits all. That means one size fits nobody, okay? Really. The chances of it fitting you are pretty slim. So you get half of your DNA from this group of ancestors over here, but you don't get exactly these percentages. That's an average. That's all we had to go with in terms of guidelines. But that is what it is. This is just a guideline. So what we're going to look at today is what's real. What's real. So DNA is passed in bundles called segments. Uh, different children receive different pieces of their parents' DNA. Sometimes parents give their children a whole chromosome. They just give it to them. Just, this, is just, this is your grandmother's here. Have the whole thing. And sometimes they give them part of grandmas and part of grandpas that are different parts but not always half. Um, these areas are called crossovers. And this right here, this line between the pink and the blue is a crossover. It's where the ancestor's DNA butts up and crosses over between one and the other. Each piece of DNA comes from an ancestor, obviously, but which one? So here's the players today that we're going to be working with. Um, my mother, who is now deceased, uh, thank God she took every DNA test I put in front of that woman because after she died, her DNA was at Family Tree DNA, it's archived, and, and after she died, I was able to order the Family Finder test for her because it didn't come out while she was still alive. And it was marginal. She was on the you know, five-year line at that time, and it worked. And I'm telling you, I have never held my breath. That woman's legacy that she left to me is unimaginable. I thank her every single day. So, my mother, me, that's me with the you know, big hair. Um, my son is the father of these children. Uh, his wife is the mother of these children and her parents. So we truly have made this a family uh, uh, educational experience for my granddaughters down here. And this is the granddaughter sequencing her own DNA last year. I am so proud of this kid. And then that's my little princess granddaughter. Uh, we'll start her sequencing next. So, here was family Christmas at my house. Yes, I know we're a geeky family. And this was one of the, the favorite gifts that Christmas. And everybody saw me. And that is literally what we did at Christmas at the table at my house. The only thing missing is the cat in the picture. We had to keep putting the cat off the table because we didn't want cat DNA. So, because, you know, there's like an ethical thing here. When you're swabbing your whole family, if there is a skeleton in the closet, it's going to come out. So if all of a sudden somebody doesn't want to test, um, then I leave it at that because I don't want, you know, there to be a very awkward situation in the family. So, in my case, Grandpa isn't really Grandpa. Grandpa is my husband. Oh, God. Did I just out myself? Well, no, of course not. That's me and Grandpa getting married. That's my son. That's my daughter. They're adults. And my granddaughter was three months old. But the only grandfather they've ever known is my husband, of course. And we all know that in the family. But think how many generations downstream Grandpa, if no one records it, that's your NPE in your family. It's not an NPE. It is not, you know, somebody, I didn't go up and shoot with the neighbor guy. Um, grandpa was step-grandpa. So, just in this case, it, it's all cool, but just be aware, you could out your family, and you don't really want to do that. So, uh, be gracious if somebody doesn't like that. So, this is what the Family Finder results look like. Every one of these slides, and this is really, really important, and I want, I want to emphasize this, how the results look depend on whose perspective you're looking from. So if you're looking from the granddaughter's perspective, 
the results are going to look entirely different than if you're looking from the grandmother's perspective or even my mother's perspective. So in every one of these slides, what I've done is I've put up in the corner, either this corner or that corner, the person whose perspective we're looking from, okay? So in this case, it is my granddaughter, who was, this was supposed to be her slide. Um, so this is her father, her mother, her sister, her maternal grandmother, me. Now, I actually have my ancestry version 2 kit uploaded too. So when you see two kits for me, that's why. And I just thought, I thought about chopping this out, and I thought, no, I'm going to leave it in there because I did that, you know? Um, my, her, the maternal grandfather, so my daughter-in-law's father, and my mother, the maternal great-grandmother, that's who we're dealing with. And these two down here, I left them in here because we have a second uh, cousin twice removed and a half a second cousin, and theoretically, this person as a degree six relative should be up here and match closer. But remember, one size fits what? Nobody. So in this case, that's not what happened. Because that sometimes isn't what happened. Okay? So I wanted to point out a couple things. First of all, see this? It says brother for the sister, and it says mother for the father. Well, obviously my son's a male, because otherwise I wouldn't have grandchildren with the thing, you know, you, you know. So, that begat thing. And, um, can you still hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. So, the problem is, one of two things. Even when you registered the kit, you got you registered the wrong gender, and you have to call him and through DNA and tell him to give you a sex change, a gender change. Um, that's what happened with my uh, my son and my daughter-in-law. I, I, their kids got swapped. Okay, so I figured that out when my son matched my daughter's in law's parents, and she matched me. But I, I forgot to tell him to change the gender on his. So they've done that now. But I, I left it up here because I wanted to tell you. The other thing that happens is, if you get this person, and this is what happened here, when I link them on the, you know, when you go in and you link people to your family tree, well, I linked her as brother instead of sister, and accidentally. So if you see something that's weird over here, it's one of those two things. Either you linked it incorrectly or the kids actually registered to the wrong gender. And this is part of why that matters, okay? But what I really want you to look at here is this right here. These are the four grandparents from the perspective of that young lady right there. And her DNA matches her four grandparents, not at 25%, not equally, she matches her maternal grandmother more closely than she matches any of her other grandparents. She matches her paternal grandmother more closely than her paternal grandfather. And obviously, uh, because I don't have my son's father available to test, we have to infer from him by subtracting me out of him. I'll show you how to do that. So what we have here is the, is the grandparents that we do have, the three grandparents that we do have, and she doesn't match them at 25%. So if we're using the 25% average, you would expect to see them exactly the same, and they're not. They never are. They never are. So let's look at this. This is a really boring slide. This is, remember I said we're going to build this step by step? This is the background of a, a parent-child match. Now, you will match your parents on every piece of DNA that you have. Because where did you get it? From your parents, right? So a parent-child, when you compare yourself to your parents, all you're going to see is a solid bar, a solid orange bar across here. That, that's important because people say, well, I only have half my parents' DNA. That's true, but you match your parents at every location. Because at every location, they either gave you a piece of their mother, or a piece of their father, so you still match them. So this is really boring, but we're going to see this when we stack the chromosome browser up, and I want to explain to you why it is entirely orange. See these tips out here at the end? That's just a user interface, okay? That doesn't mean you're not matching there. And the gray spots here in the middle are segments of our DNA that don't have enough SNPs to measure, so those are untested areas. So just ignore the gray parts and ignore these tiny little black tips out here. Okay? 
because that's the only DNA that the daughter has is her mother and her father. Okay? So we can look here and see while grandparents share approximately 25% or contribute approximately 25% of their DNA to their <coughs> grandchildren, it's not exactly. exactly. And the other thing is I want to point out chromosome 20 and 21 here. 20 and 21, she inherited that entire chromosome from her grandmother. So she inherited none of her grandfather's chromosome there. And that is not unusual. We see that a lot. It's not unusual at all. So in the next generation, she can't pass any of her grandfather's DNA on it because she doesn't have any of those two chromosomes. So I, I wanted to put this in a pedigree format that we all are used to looking at as genealogists and give you a break from that from the chromosome browser. What I did, because this is orange and black, the chromosomes uh, have been orange and black, is I made this orange and black. So if you look, view this as a pedigree chart where the grand grandmother is orange and the grandfather is black, what we just saw, um, you can see that in the first generation, the daughter gets half orange and half black. There's four segments there. But in some subsequent generations, if there were four children and there are not, um, but if there were, and they could, she could inherit like this in terms of those segments. So she could do orange and black, black and orange, orange and orange, or black and black. Um, so for each, actually that's each location, but for this we're just going to call them segments, okay? So that's why you have four children down here. If you actually don't have the grandparents and you can sequence four children, you can get most of the parents' genome by sequencing four children. So that is what we're looking at. That's how it actually works. And then if you were to go on further down here, of course, you'd be back to where there are other colors of chromosomes coming in from people as they marry in the next generation, uh, back to one of the first slides we had that showed all those colored chromosome pieces. So let's go back here, and let's look at this oldest granddaughter that compared to both her grandmother and grandfather who both tested. So what we have is an exact reverse. If you look at uh, chromosome 1, except I can't read yet, you can see that the black part is a little orange and a big black, and if you go over here, it's exactly reversed because she got either got the DNA from her grandmother or grandfather. So when you look at these, they, they're like a puzzle. They, they snap exactly into each other. She thought this was so cool. So if you look at the from the maternal grandmother's perspective, now this lady, to both of uh, uh, her granddaughters, so both granddaughters are represented here in this compared to the maternal grandmother, you can see how who inherited which of the maternal grandmother's DNA. Uh, the younger one is blue and the older one is orange. And in some areas they overlap uh, significantly and in other areas there's none at all. For example, the younger granddaughter got none of this chromosome here, and the older granddaughter got part of it, but the rest of it was from the grandfather. So it was very interesting to look at those compared from the grandmother's perspective. The maternal, um, here's the maternal grandparents, both the grandmother and the grandfather compared to both. And again, these would snap, if you put those on top of each other, they would lock in just like puzzles. Okay, let's move on to something else. You can only look at chromosome browsers for so long. So, let's look at the inheritance percentages here. Morris is laughing. Um, the paternal grandparents are, as we expect them, here's the expected column, expected average, both the center of organs and percentages. And we expect them to be 25% each. In fact, that's what people will tell you. But again, one size fits, nobody. So here's what we have for the oldest granddaughter and the youngest granddaughter in terms of percentages. Now we only tested four people, but we have six people's results up there. How did I do that? Well, we saw that the grandmother and grandfather, the maternal grandmother and grandfather are exact mirror images, right? Well, we tested me, the paternal grandmother, and what they didn't match to me, they had to get from my son's father who's not available for testing. So because of that, I can tell exactly how much of his DNA they got. 
And we did the same exact thing with my mother right here uh, because she was the only living person in that generation. But because we know how much she got her DNA and we got my DNA, I can tell you exactly how much she got of my father's DNA as well. So we tested four, but we really got six. That's like two brief. So I'm feeling left out here because I I'm the one who, who, uh, who sponsored all this testing, but we haven't talked about me yet. We've talked all about the paternal grandparents because there's two of them, you know? So let's look how they stack up against me. The paternal grandfather wasn't available for testing, but I can infer that all these black matches here are him, right? Because they don't match me, I'm black, so they have to be my son's father. So this slide is no longer boring, is it? It's no longer just orange and black. Look at all these colors. So this is my, from my mother's perspective, the oldest generation. So now we're looking at four generations in a row. Who is completely orange up here? You, you should know this. It's me, because I match my mother at every location, right? So I'm this completely orange bar. My son is the blue bar. Now we have no control at Family Tree DNA on how these colors are. You have no idea how many times I had to do this to get my son to turn out blue. So my son's the blue bar. And he's colored, if you're looking here, I've colored, the, uh, surrounded the pictures with the color that they are on my chromosome browser. Uh, so here's my son, and here's me, and here's my granddaughters, all compared to my mother. So I gave my son my father's chromosome 4. And if you look up here on chromosome 4, the only person that's matching my mother is me. So when it came time to give it to my son, I was not the least bit generous in giving him my mother, I gave him my father. So obviously none of the girls can match him, can match her either because it stopped in my generation. So that's when you look down here, same with chromosome 11 down here, he didn't get anything from, he got my father, so he can't, the girls can't match my mother. So if you look, that's also the case in 10, 14, and 20. So by inference, we also know my father would be is the black man. So um, in case you haven't noticed, the dress I'm wearing is a chromosome browser. And if you look back, it's this. This is all the generations in my family. So I had to wear it today. And I found a purse to match here at the show, too. Thank you. So I want to show you a really easy example with the X chromosome. Now, the X chromosome, as we talked the other day, has special inheritance property because men only uh, get an X from their mother because they received a Y that makes them male from their father. So I'm going to use the X because it's really easy in this case. Uh, I match my mother 100%. I'm the orange. My son in blue matches my mother on the blue segment. So who does he match on the black part? My father, right? Okay. But look what he did. He gave my granddaughters all of the piece of my X chromosome that I gave him. So when you look at them, they stack up just exactly perfectly. Except for these funny little ends. I can't tell you how many times people say, but, but ends are longer on the children than they can't be because he couldn't give them more than he had. And you're right. Those are called fuzzy boundaries. They can happen one of two reasons. One is that it's internal processing at the vendor. Uh, they use buckets, uh, which we're not going to really discuss in detail. And the other one is they could match me by chance match by chance on just a little extra on both ends. So I downloaded the results here, and I looked at this, and sure enough, if you look at the actual results and do the math, you can see there is a little more showing, and it, it has to be by chance, because you couldn't have actually gotten that, because you can only give what you get. So phasing. We're going to talk a little bit about phasing, because phasing is really important. Phasing is how you know um, what to, to, how your matches, where they match. So other than making a dress or a piece of clothing, you can use this information for your genealogy in many ways. So we're going to compare your matches 
to the DNA of your parents to identify which side the match is from. Because if you've got your parents, they've got to match one or the other of your parents, or maybe they don't. Is there a third alternative? Well, there is, and that's if they match by chance. So if you don't have your parents, you can do the same type of thing by siblings, aunts, aunts, uncles, first cousins. Those people are really important because when you match people in common with them and on the same segment, how, how do you get that? The only way you get that same segment is from that common ancestor. It's the only way you, you can get it. So matches that match you and them on the same DNA are known as phase. With parents and people who match you but don't match each other, then they are identical by chance. And I have um, a, a concept series on my blog where I just talk about concepts and parental phasing is one of those. So family tree DNA offers something called family phasing. In order to do this, you have to connect people on your tree of family tree DNA. So I went in and I connected, I, I extended the tree down to my grandchildren and I connected them and I connected my in-laws and I connected everybody up to my mother and all my other cousins where they're supposed to go. And then family tree DNA internally uses that to phase your matches. Phasing means they, they tell you, based on the actual DNA, which side of the tree those matches are on. So if you look up here, you can see that I have 499, um, actually that's not me, but this person has 499 uh, maternal matches and 676 and four that are both. So when you look at those here, this is one of the girls, um, you can see that they match uh, the sisters and the parents on both sides, which is accurate. They match the sisters and the parents on both the mother, their mother and their father's side. So this is what paternal phasing looks like. These people whose names I have removed are assigned to one side or the other based on you connecting the DNA of known people to your tree. So they are doing that for you. You don't have to do that. The next thing you want to do is you want to click one of these people and you want to say, okay, I know this person here is related on my father's side, if this was you from your perspective, and click that and then click in common with, which is an option up here that is not showing, and then you can see who else you match in common with that person. So that gives you an idea of how or why you match that. It's not foolproof because sometimes you can get it in common with where you match it from both parents, but it's the next step in your genealogy journey. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about triangulation. Who in here was in my talk yesterday and knows about the new triangulator tool? Or if you subscribe to my blog, that uh, blog that talks about the new triangulator tool uh, was sent out last night. If you don't subscribe to my blog, uh, go look because it's there for you. So there's a new tool that was not available that was uh, when I wrote this. So uh, and I, we talked about it yesterday for the first time. So when people match on the same segment, it's easy to think that all those people are from a common ancestor, but they're not because you have a mother's side and a father's side to your chromosome. So there's, there are three groups that your matches will fall into. One is the mother's side, one is the father's side, the group is going to be identical by chance. If you have both parents, it's very easy to tell which group is the identical by chance group because they're not going to match either of your parents. So how do you know the difference? Because we don't have all of our ancestors to test, unfortunately, we have to triangulate. So they can't both match you on that same segment unless your parents triangulate. And people say, okay, if your parents triangulate and they match each other, you've got a really bad problem. Either they're extremely endogenous, or they accidentally were adopted and met each other and were siblings and married each other. We actually have one of those uh, that we found. So, if you are trying to explain triangulation, you just say, do your parents triangulate? Well, no, they don't match. They both match you from your perspective. Do they match each other? Hell no. They don't match each other. So, you can see that they match you, but they don't match each other. So here, from the perspective of my little princess, all of her grandparents match her, right? They all match her. Here's all of us, her parents. They all match her. They're all related to her, but they're not all related to each other. 
So when you're trying to explain this concept, say, from your perspective, are you related to all four of your grandparents? Of course you are. Are all four of the grandparents related to each other? They say yes, you got a whole different problem going on. Okay? So that's a really good example of why we try and do it. I call it my best example ever, and you'll see a blog about this pretty soon. So here's you and your parents. You match both of your parents. Here's our triangle. You, orange parent, blue parent. You match both of them. They don't match each other. Really simple. So here you are. Now we're going to talk about half-siblings, because if you have half-siblings, that is a gift of God. Because if someone matches one half-sibling, you know they're from that parent's side. And if they match your other half-sibling, you know they're from that parent's side. So you can triangulate with half-sibling from each side very, very easily. So this is you from your mother and father, and here's your half-sibling that you send from one. So that's great, because you can tell these are from your perspective. They both match you, but they... But those people come from different sides because you're looking at different half-siblings. So here's half-sibling triangulation. You match both of your half-siblings, but your half-siblings don't match each other. You have an orange one and a blue one. So here's half-siblings and parents. And I borrowed this from somebody who is gracious enough. This isn't from my family, but I didn't have this. So you match both parents at the top, your orange, you match your half-siblings because they're both matching you, right? And in some areas, everybody matches you. In that one segment up there, everybody matches you. Uh, so you know that you've got common DNA, but they don't match each other because they're half-siblings. So you only match on the segments that you got in common from the same parent. And here's this again. Family matching and family tree DNA does this automatically for you. So if you have half siblings, I'll beg them to trust. So this is triangulation with half siblings. And this I, I almost call this quadrangulation, but I don't want to introduce a new term into this. But what I did is I flipped the I flipped to the two triangles so that you can see here is a group of matching people and they match with you and the blue parent. And here's a group of matching people match with you and the orange parent, and through your half-siblings, you can figure that out very easily by looking at who matches, because your half-siblings don't match each other. These people all match. So again, this is going to be a blog. It's also on the YouTube video, so if you need to look at this longer and think about it, that's cool, but, I'm not, but that's exactly how this works. Your matches fall into match groups uh, based on half-siblings. So, in summary, what do you want to do? You want to test everyone who's willing. You want to buy those DNA kits. You want to have that swab party on Christmas Day uh, or on Thanksgiving. Um, give, give, uh, serve wine liberally, well, not to the children, but to you know, anybody who might think they don't want to test. However, if they really don't want to test, you have to respect that. Um, you know, there could be multiple reasons. I always try to figure out why. And if, if they're just having, kind of, you know, a concern I can address, that's great. But if they really don't want to, I don't say to them, um, oh, gosh, I know why you don't want to test. Hmm. I don't do that. I always think it to my uh, So after you test, uh, upload your JEDCOM. And yesterday we talked about putting gas in the car. There's a list of about 10 things you can do to help yourself with family tree DNA to use those tools. Please refer to yesterday's session about putting gas in the car. Because if you don't do the things like upload your, your, um, your JEDCOM file and attaching the DNA to the person in the tree, if you don't do those things, family tree DNA can't do family matching for you and they can't help you as much as they could if you were to do those things. So do all those things. Um, use family faith and it's a built-in feature even without parents because if you have your parents, that's great, but let's face it, you, you know, I, didn't, I only had one parent left when I started my genealogy. It, by the time we retire and going to start our genealogy, most of us don't have parents left. So what they've done is they're, they've been able to use siblings and first cousins, up to third cousins, to phase your DNA in the maternal and maternal buckets. So you, you, but you have to connect them to your tree in order for them to do it. Uh, so you want to triangulate to confirm ancestors. Yesterday's triangulation tool is a third-party tool written uh, by Goran. I'm not sure if he's in here right now. He's in the back. Um, 
he will be at the Family Tree DNA booth to show you how to use the new triangulation tool. Turn around, look at Lauren for a minute. Wait. Okay. That's the person you're looking for for the new tool. It is literally press a button and it tells you if they triangulate and how. So it, it is a way cool tool. Um, so you want to triangulate to confirm your ancestors, to confirm that those people match you on that same segment, that those two that match you. And don't forget about Y and mitochondrial DNA. We've talked a lot about autosomal, but we forget that Y and mitochondrial are, are really important genealogical tools. A lot of people don't even, in here I'm sure you know about them, but a lot of people in the larger community don't even understand what, that Y and mitochondrial are available and how they can help you. If you don't understand that, I have great articles on my blog for you, uh, introductory. Uh, please utilize those tools because they can track your direct matrilineal line and your direct patrilineal line, and you can use matching to see who matches you on those lines in addition to autosomal DNA. Uh, subscribe to my blog. DNA is a family affair. Um, please, uh, you don't have to sing Sister, Sister Sledge to do it. That uh, swab your family and have fun. And one of the ways you can do that is to share with them, share the results, sit down, tell your family story. Not just about the DNA, show them the chromosome, and explain the family story, kind of like we did, but maybe in a less technical fashion for those people. Because that's how we wrote them in to loving our ancestors the way we do. And that's also how we recruit the next generation, because we want to pass it on, and the way to do that is through DNA and science to them. Um, that's it for me. I think we're going to open for questions. Great. Okay, well, we'll take a few questions. Thanks, Roberta. That was absolutely amazing that we actually see four generations of DNA testing. If you come down here, because I'm just a little bit scared of that loud speaker. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, so it would be natural uh, to with a population smaller in any country. Uh, it would be natural for uh, grandparents to have. Uh, have some sort of a connection because A, you married in your social class, your religion, and uh, you didn't move very far. That, that's so true. That'd be nice, be no problem. Uh, and, you know, uh, my family has a dog on both sides where they did exactly that. They married into the population. It's not a problem unless you're actually finding segments on common segments on the same in the same people, and you may, but you may be able to track those back to the same ancestors too. Uh, what I really was saying, if you have a whole list of first cousin marriages, like for three generations in a row, that's really problematic. But that rarely happens. So. How many people in the audience have uh, found a double cousin connection on their family tree? So there's quite a few. And how many people have had uh, two brothers married two sisters? Okay. Two identical three twins. Two brothers married three sisters? That was just greedy. You know, uh, it's really oh, yeah. interesting because my daughter-in-law's mother's side is French Canadian, and my mother has a French Canadian Acadian line. So we were fully prepared to have some common segments, and so far we have not found them. <coughs> There's a huge amount of endogamy in the Acadian population, and also in the French Canadian population that she came from. And so, you found nothing as yet. Not yet, but it's far back. Kathy, do you want to ask a question? Sorry. Um, question over here. Hi. I just want to ask about the actual slips. Mm -hmm. So, you get a DNA tested and the act slips. Now, you were saying at a previous, or somebody was saying at a previous lecture, that um, with, with Irish, for example, we're all, um, we're all very tolerant to lactose. So, that mm -hmm. particular slip do they hone in on particular steps that they know should be, or how do they do it? Okay, that's a really good question. Uh, she was asked about specific SNPs and that, like, the, in the Irish lactose uh, tolerance is at 95%. These are focused on groups of SNPs. The, the, remember I said there's buckets? Uh, and I don't know how every vendor does this, but I do know how family tree DNA does this. So what they do is they look at buckets. So if you have a whole group, a whole run of SNPs that match, there, at some level, it indicates common genealogy as opposed to a common uh, ancestral group long ago. So that's the question. 
There's another question that usually follows this, so I'm just going to answer it. If you have, we have something called no call. So you're, when they sequence your DNA, it reads, it reads, it reads, it reads, and all of a sudden, for some reason, the spot doesn't read. So it's not counted as a mismatch. It's counted as a, like an oops. So it, there's what we call a healing routine. It just kind of says, okay, if there's this many SNPs in a row that don't match, it's okay. But if there's one more than that, it's now a break. You know, so the, it's, it's pretty flexible. There is an area on chromosome 6, and there are other pileup areas. And if you use the word pileup when you search on my blog, you'll find an article that tells you where they are. Where there are uh, on chromosome 6, it's the HLA region that deals with blood types. And a whole lot of people have this in common. So if you find you have a whole group of matches on that area of chromosome 6, and they don't extend beyond it, I would just kind of ignore those. Now, if they extend beyond it, they're, that might mean they're genealogically important. So that's a really good question. Other questions for Roberta? What's a practical, I mean this is, I think it's absolutely fantastic you're able to trace uh, the DNA down through four generations. Is there any practical application in terms of the twins at the bottom of course? Or not the twins at the bottom, but the daughters, of the, the two uh, granddaughters at the bottom. Is there any practical application of that? Well, obviously if they want to do genealogy there will be. But in terms of my granddaughters, the, uh, my granddaughter, the oldest granddaughter, who was sequencing her own DNA, went up to Michigan State last year to a science uh, thing and, um, for children. Um, and the person who was uh, teaching it actually made some mistakes. And she corrects them. So I think for her, for the children, I think it brings science into history and it encourages them. Because if I had been taught history, and understood that I had a connection to it, I would have liked it a whole lot better. And this gives them a connection to science, it gives them a connection to history, and it brings it all together, and it's about them. It's very personal, it's in their veins. And now what she wants to do is she wants to find out, and I didn't include this because of the personal nature, but she wants to go back, she wants to look at which grandparent gave her the blue eye, and which grandparent gave her the freckles, and which grandparent gave her some other thing. And she is doing this, this is what we're working through now, uh, now that we've worked through this, now we're looking at, okay, let's figure out how do you find that information? How do we find that information? So I've actually been working with her on that with Prometheus uh, because it gives us also some medical things. So I didn't use that because of the personal nature of it, plus I only had an hour. But, um, you know, kids get, they're really curious. and. And um, it's really opened up the, the questions from her and the younger child have really been amazing as we sit at the kitchen table and do that. I have to tell you, I'm fascinated that we can sit at the kitchen table and we can look at this and we can trace these segments sometime from back nine or ten generations without question and we know who they came from and then I can tell them the story of that ancestor and connect it back. And, like, and, and on Tuesday, Morris and I are going to where my McDowell ancestor in Ireland was from, and we have his Y DNA too. And we also know some of his autosomal DNA. And now we can connect that for them in terms of history, in terms of being able to bring them life for these kids. I wish we had had this when I was a kid. I don't know if that's what you meant. No, no, uh, that's, uh, that, that's a very good explanation of, of, of or a good answer to the question, because I suppose the other thing that, that they, they're a bit young for it now, but when they're a little bit older, you can start looking at, well, what's the chromosome that carries the gene for cystic fibrosis? Not that there is cystic fibrosis in the family, but if it's this portion of, of a particular chromosome that carries the disease, if we were to have the gene on that chromosome, granddaughter A would be passing it on potentially to her children, but not granddaughter B. We've actually discussed that uh, in the family, and because they are minors, um, you know, I would not go there without both parents' consent, obviously. And so I make sure when we're having these discussions that both parents are at the table because it's also educational for them and they're, they're interested. They're not interested at the same level she's interested, but um, she's actually asked some questions that are health related. And so we talked about, you know, when you, uh, it's, it's Pandora's box. And, and when you open it, you can never unknow what's in that box when you open the medical part. And that's one of the reasons we keep the genealogy part separate from the medical part, because you can do this all day long and not expose any of those kind of family secrets or, or propensity. And just because you have a propensity doesn't mean you have the disease, as you, as you well know. 
but it can cause anxiety and concern, especially for younger people. So I intentionally don't go there with them uh, without their parents' consent. So what we have done so far is we've limited what they are doing to looking at um, which um, um, RS locations or which SNPs uh, contribute to eye color and which SNPs contribute to traits that we can look up safely without exposing anything they might want to have exposed. Uh, some of those can be quite fun as well. Wet earwax versus dry yeah, earwax. Lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance. Mm -hmm. Who can drink milk? Who cannot? They also want to know which of those things are Neanderthal on the way. Yes, <laughs> yes. Is my brother more the Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, of my ancestors, and like I said, I have written every article that includes something about DNA. So if you read the 52 ancestors, it's almost every Sunday, it will have something about DNA. The next one coming out is when I went to Terra out here, and I descended from my online hostages to my McNeil side, and I talk about that. Uh, so I don't know Niall Park personally, but he's my ancestor, he's going in there. Uh, I have also uh, printed the, the ones I've contributed them to li local libraries, the you know, ones that involve uh, ancestors from a particular region. Uh, so it is in printed form there. I've been uh, contributed them to the Allen County Public Library, which in the U.S. Uh, is, uh, has a very large online uh, presence for uh, ge genealogy. And so it's written publicly. Uh, people have connected my articles to their trees on ancestry. Uh, sometimes they do it properly and sometimes they don't, but you know, for me, I'm more concerned about the actual correct information being out there than I am anything else. What do you recommend for the rest of us? What do you uh, for the rest of us? I use WordPress. It's very, very easy. It's also uh, free unless you, I have my own domain name, so I pay $99 a year. It's still very cheap. Uh, but it's free. It's free, quote, forever, whatever that means in our technology era. Uh, and it, all you do, you type and upload pictures, so you don't need to know anything about programming to do it. So I recommend WordPress. Even my granddaughter can use WordPress. I mean, it's, you know, and my husband, too. So if you can't use it, you can get your grandchildren to do it that's for right. you. What a great way of involving them. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, thanks very, very much for that fabulous presentation. Uh, we've learned so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big thank you to the winner.